Hi everybody. So we're going to talk today about foundations and nutrition. We're going to start with an introduction to some of the principles and concepts we're going to be using all semester. We have to start this conversation really with an understanding of what the field of nutrition is about. And so looking at this slide, we're going to be talking about the human context around nutrition as it relates to health and also our own enjoyment of food and nutrition. Um, eating is a very, very visceral uh, experience for many humans and so we have to keep sight on that as well that it's something we want to enjoy and there's a real human angle to nutrition although it is a bench science um, this course doesn't focus as much on biochemistry and biology we're going to look at consumer nutrition for the most part so when I speak about these multiple con constructs or concepts um, even contexts around nutrition we want to keep in mind um, that it fits into lots of different areas of human life so there's a political angle we have to consider things like government subsidies around food and what gets produced and what doesn't get produced for instance in the US we tend to subsidize crops and we have a monoculture system so we're subsidizing the production of a lot of corn also soybeans and wheat and even potatoes. In France, they have a very different model. And what they're doing there is they're subsidizing farmers and saying, if you're really good at growing broccoli, you should grow broccoli. Or if you're good at turnips, grow the turnips. So in that way, they have a very different food system. So we're going to look at food systems to some extent and how politics play into that. Then there's also a cultural angle to food. And if you've ever traveled, or you've been to someone's house even, who maybe is from a different culture, you'll notice there are differences. And we have social norms around food. Uh, for instance, in every culture, when you come to someone's house, they want to feed you. It's a sign of welcome. And then there are also different kinds of rules about the types of food used, the time when it's consumed, maybe even holiday meals or traditions. So that's kind of a social or cultural appreciation of nutrition. And then, of course, economics. And everybody has a budget, whether it's a generous budget or a somewhat more narrow budget. We're all concerned with the cost of food. And we can look at that on an individual household level. Um, maybe I'm going to the grocery store and I notice that something's on sale and that's the only time I'm going to buy it because it's expensive. Or there are things I'm going to splurge on. So that's more of an individual focus on the cost of food. But we also see that on a societal level because we know there are people that have a difficult time feeding themselves. So that's where the government sometimes steps in. And we have to think about how this is linked with the political context as well. Um, you could think about the SNAP program. It's Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. We used to call this food stamps. We also have the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children. And these are programs set up by the government to help people who might have a difficult time feeding themselves under normal economic conditions. So we'll talk about that later in the course. And then we also have a religious context. And even if you're not a religious person or affiliated with any particular religious group, you can appreciate some of the differences. Uh, for instance, um, Catholics have certain choices around food that they'll make at certain times of the year. Uh, we can think about people who um, are Jewish, and maybe they keep kosher. Uh, Tibetan Buddhists, um, even Seventh-day Adventists, which I should say, they're actually one of the longest lived groups in the world. And they basically have a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Um, and so it's a very, very different approach to health and nutrition and their engagement with food. So we'll look at that as well, kind of on a um, more um, ad hoc basis, as those topics kind of come up in our discussions around protein or um, feeding children or things like this. Then we also have geography. And again, where we live, to some extent, determines what we eat. This is changing to a large extent in our world because we have these immense transportation systems and a global food supply. So I can get apples from Chile, or I can get apples from Washington State. I can get pineapples from Hawaii or from Thailand. We have this opportunity to really eat a lot of foods from around the world, but still we're seeing this movement towards uh, local seasonal food uh, where people are really coming to appreciate what's in their own backyard and what's produced here. So that's something that I think if you read a newspaper or listen to the radio or talk to people about food, um, they're coming to really appreciate about where they live. Uh, then we also have biology. And as I said earlier, nutrition is a science. This is what we call a bench science. 
which means that there are people who spend their entire career uh, in a laboratory looking at maybe one transporter, a cellular transporter that brings in um, iron and copper and zinc in their intestines. Um, this course really isn't designed to get into that level of science. It's a survey course, which means that it's about an inch deep and a mile wide, which is very different than other courses you might see in nutrition, where you might concentrate very, very heavily in one discrete area, maybe vitamins or minerals, um, and develop a, a very, very deep appreciation of that particular topic. So in a way, this is wonderful because we're going to have an opportunity to touch on a lot of different areas around nutrition. And I think that most people find throughout the course that there are things they can apply to their life. Um, and really, nutrition is very, very relevant. Uh, so if you don't have a strong biology background, don't be worried. Um, we're going to talk you through the science um, and keep it very approachable. All right, and then of course we have culinary and food science. And this is kind of the fun part of nutrition because we all uh, can appreciate a well-cooked meal, something that's prepared very nicely. Uh, some of us enjoy preparing it and some of us enjoy eating it. Um, and so think about that as well um, because food preparation really tells us a lot about its implications for health. You've probably heard very often that fried food is a choice that we should make seldom. Um, but raw foods maybe or foods that are cooked um, in very specific ways might have health benefits. And we'll look at that as well. All right. So I want to talk about a couple of vocabulary words that I think are going to be important to us as we progress throughout the course. And I'm just going to mention these and I'd like you to look them up and be able to define them. You will find that some of them are very um, linked. They're very relatable to each other and then also to other topics. So we have undernutrition and overnutrition. And these um, are very simply that we're getting too little of something or too much of something. It could be too much fat or too little fat, uh, too much of a vitamin uh, or too little. Okay? We can also look at it more on a large scale basis in the diet and say that someone's diet is lacking overall. It's a poor quality diet. For instance, with children in the U.S., we know that 81% of children's diets are considered substandard or poor. So that is an overall judgment we can make about someone's diet. Most people are doing pretty well, though. The vast majority of Americans you know, are trying you know, hard to make sure they're getting enough of the micronutrients and the right kinds of macronutrients. So then we start to look at individual areas for improvement. Then we also have a related concept called dietary inadequacy. And this is very, very similar to undernutrition in some ways. So it might be a discrete area in the diet that needs a little bit more attention. Someone may not be getting enough fiber, for instance. Um, we want people, uh, women, 19 to 51, to be getting about 25 grams of fiber a day, and men in that age group to be getting 38. The average American's getting about 10 to 12. So in that dietary inadequacy framework, we can talk about individual areas within diets. Then food choices. And this is really a fun area, I think, because we all choose food for different reasons. And we think we're maybe making one or two choices a day around food. But in reality, we are making just an exponential number of decisions. For instance, breakfast. Uh, most people say, well, I make three decisions. I'm going to have coffee, I'm going to have cereal, and I'm going to have a banana. But if you unpack that and look at each one of those, you're making so many more decisions. You know, what size cup of coffee am I going to add sugar? Am I going to add two spoonfuls, one spoonful? Am I going to have milk in it? Am I going to have half and half? Am I going to have coffee creamer? So there, right, you know, just in that one food, you have all these decisions. And the same is true for everything else you eat, not just at breakfast, but throughout the day. So consider that and really appreciate the reasons we're making those decisions, OK? Uh, and then interactions between food and lifestyle. And people very often talk about genetics. They'll say, well, you know, my mom was a big lady, or, you know, my grandfather had diabetes. Genetics aren't destiny. We know this. You have an opportunity having that information to actually make informed choices. So we want to talk about how you do that. And also, what are the choices that we're going to strive for? There's no diet that's absolutely awful, and there's no diet that's absolutely perfect. We're really each day trying to make good choices. So it's about moving toward that goal. Okay? And we're going to start our conversation really looking into nutrition, understanding the six classes of nutrients. So when we think about this, um, we want to kind of break these down a little bit. We have three 
different energy yielding nutrients. Okay, these are the ones that give us caloric value. So you'll see we have fat, carbohydrates, and protein. And I invite you to appreciate that fat has nine calories per gram. And you see I've got the abbreviation KCAL. That's just kind of a holdover from nutrition science that we call energy a kilocalorie. But most people are familiar with it as a calorie. So when you read the Cheerios box and you see that it has 110 calories per serving, this is what we're talking about. Okay, and then carbohydrates and protein each have four. Okay, so by far, you know, the fat is the most energy dense of all of the nutrients. Then we have three non caloric nutrients water, the zero calorie beverage, always a good choice, and then we have vitamins and minerals. And if you think about something like five, five hour energy, maybe you've seen that down at, you know, 7 Eleven or Cumberland Farms or something, it tells you it gives you energy, and you turn over and look at the label, and it's only got five calories. Five calories isn't very much. It's about what's in a stalk of celery. So where does that energy come from? Well, what they're talking about in that sense is something called metabolic energy. It's not caloric energy. It's not actually giving you fuel. Those B vitamins in the five-hour energy drink instead are giving you something called metabolic energy, which is very, very different. That metabolic energy or those B vitamins help you take food and turn it into fuel. Okay, so it's a, it's a really different different situation. We'll talk about this more when we talk about vitamins, but for now I want you to concentrate on knowing the caloric value of these particular energy nutrients. With that information about how many calories are supplied from each gram of fat, carbohydrates, or protein, we can very easily figure out the energy in a sample of food. So for instance, if I were to take this particular sample of bread, you can see that it's got three grams of fat, and so what I would do to figure out the amount of energy provided from that fat is simply to multiply. So it would be the three grams times nine calories per gram. So the fat provides 27 calories. And we can do the same with each of these. So here we have 23 grams of carbohydrates, and I would multiply that times four, and then would tell me how many calories are supplied just from the carbohydrates. And I can do the same here with three grams of protein, okay? And I invite you to use a calculator with this. You know, we've kind of gotten out of practice with our multiplication tables, and we rely on a lot of these little helper devices, so feel free to do that. Um, so the 23 times 4, uh, I think that would be about um, 92 or so, and then the 3 times 4 is 12. And if we add each one of those, we're going to arrive at how many calories are in one serving of this food. Okay? It's not difficult to do. And I really encourage you, if you're sitting down to breakfast or any meal and you have a, um, a companion with you, say, I'm going to show you a trick. If you give me three pieces of information on that label, I'm going to tell you how many calories are in one serving. And it's really fun to do. It's kind of like a party trick. And you'll amaze your friends and family that you have this knowledge. So give it a shot. Ask them for the amount of fat the amount of carbohydrates and the amount of protein, and then do the math, okay? And so I've put another one here. Here we have a tofurkey kielbasa, maybe not a food you would normally choose, but for our purposes, this is great because it's going to allow us an opportunity to figure out the number of calories from this food. So I'm going to let you figure this one out on your own, okay? All right, so I want to move on to another concept that we're going to use throughout the semester. And it's one that you're going to hear me reference um, not only in other presentations, but also in the notes, and you're going to see it in our textbook as well. There's a concept called nutrient density. And the importance of this is that we want people to choose nutrient-dense foods. So I go down to the supermarket and I ask the, the clerk to bring me a nutrient-dense food, and they scratch their head. So we kind of have to unpack that a little bit and tell them what we're looking for. We want a food that's high in vitamins and minerals per calorie. Okay? So for instance, I invite you to think, of, uh, think in extremes in this situation. Think about the difference between orange juice and orange soda. Right? Orange juice has all kinds of vitamins and minerals in it that are not supplied by the orange soda. They might have the same caloric value, maybe they're both 150 calories for an 8 ounce serving, but when you consider the vitamins and minerals in that juice, it's a clear winner. It's much more nutrient dense. If I were to ask you to think of nutrient dense choices overall at the supermarket, you'd probably head to the produce section 
You think of things that are green, for instance, maybe kale or broccoli. You would think of things that are brightly colored. And we hear this message all the time to eat the rainbow. And that's got a lot of merit when we think about nutrient-dense foods. There are some exceptions to this, which don't necessarily make our exception foods bad, but there's something to consider. When we look at foods that are enriched or fortified, meaning that they have vitamins and minerals added to them, we have to kind of take a step back and think about you know, whether or not they're naturally occurring in the food, um, whether or not it fits into our diet overall. There's a lot of considerations, and this comes down to those food choices and why we're choosing particular foods. Generally, we want people to choose whole foods, which naturally have vitamins and minerals in them, rather than heavily processed foods that have them added back. For instance, white bread, if you think about that you know, loaf of really squishy white bread, that has a lot of vitamins and minerals added to it. They aren't naturally occurring. It doesn't make the bread bad, but it's something to consider. We want to go for whole foods that are minimally messed around with, okay? Very often people will say to me, they'll stop me in the supermarket because I live in a small town, and they'll say, Lisa, you know, this is what I'm eating. Do you think I have a good diet? And I'm like, well, I don't know. There are a lot of things to consider. And what I talk to them about are five characteristics of a healthy diet. And I say, now that you are armed with these tools, you can assess your diet, you can assess your child's diet, your grandma's diet, your neighbor's, anyone. Okay? So we want to look at these characteristics that kind of give us a hint about if we're moving in the right direction. So the first one is adequacy. And when we talk about adequacy, we're looking for a diet that provides all of the essential nutrients. And let me tell you, that's hard. That is really hard to every single day get all the vitamins, all the minerals, all my fiber, and those macronutrients. Most people can't do that. So when we think about adequacy, it's about time, over, over time on average. If you, if you like strawberries, you might notice that when they're in season, you eat a lot of them. And then when they're not in season, you rarely eat them. So we tend to eat foods at certain times where we might have a lot of it or not so much of it. So again, please consider that this is over time on average. The RDAs are not meant to be met every single day, okay? So some days you'll reach them, some days you won't, some days you'll have a little more, and that's fine. Then we have balance. And for this one, I really have to get out my scales here, right? Because when we think about balance, this is a word we're really you know, hearing a lot in our lives, you know, work-life balance, um, exercise balance, um, kind of emotional balance. When we apply this term to nutrition and to diet, we're talking about an opportunity to use foods in appropriate amounts so that we don't exclude another food. So I really love the example of calcium-rich foods. If you think about a calcium-rich food, you might immediately think of milk. So we have milk up here, has a lot of calcium in it, but it's very, very low in iron, okay? So if I fill my diet with a whole bunch of this calcium-rich milk, I might be low in iron. So then I say, well, all right, I'm kind of low in iron. I'm going to focus on foods that have more iron. And so what might come to mind is something like a piece of beef, maybe some steak. And if you look at that food, it's very rich in iron, but it's very low in calcium. So there now I've gone the other direction and I've kind of swung to the extreme. So there's a place where you can actually have both of these in your diet in an appropriate amount that doesn't exclude the other. So that's this concept of balance in someone's diet. Then we have caloric control. And this is a message that um, we're hearing a lot because so many people in our society are overweight. And there are a lot of reasons for that. It's not a personal failure. Um, and again, we'll talk about why these um, you know, body situations occur. But one of them that we point to is about energy balance. And this is simply what you put into the system has to be used. So if you have a 2,000 calorie diet and you only use 1,800 calories, you've, you're in this positive area of 200 calories. And that over time translates to weight gain. For someone that's kind of um, going the other direction, maybe they're having 2,000 calories, but they're very, very active, or they're growing, or they're pregnant, and they need 2,200 calories, they're going to be in deficit. So there they might be losing weight, or you might see an erosion of health in some other way. So we want people to be at this kind of neutral area where they're not gaining or losing unless they're intending to do that on purpose. All right, and then we have variety. And this is, this is a head scratcher for a lot of people. Because when I tell them how the government assesses variety and what counts as variety, they're shocked. So think about your day and how many different foods you have. And you might say, oh, you know, I've had about 10 foods. You need to have more. Okay, well, I'm going to add a few more foods. I've got 20. Still not enough. We're looking for you to have 30 different foods a day. 
And you're like, oh my goodness, how do I do that? Well, there are a couple things. It doesn't need to be a full serving of food. So there might be a day where you grab a few almonds and throw it into you know, your cereal in the morning. Or you have half a banana in it. Or maybe you um, have a couple spoonfuls of yogurt. So remember, it doesn't have to be a full serving of food. We're having a little bit of all these different foods. And the reason this is important is because it gets us back to that first characteristic of a healthy diet, which is adequacy. If you have lots of different foods in your diet, you're more likely to reach adequate intakes of all of those different micronutrients, which is you know, a very, very important goal for us. And then we have moderation. And this is, you saw me make that face of eek, this is a concept that Americans really need to get in touch with in a lot of ways. Um, moderation tells us that there's no terrible food. If you love a Big Mac, have a Big Mac, but not every day, probably not every week, maybe once a month or once a year, okay? And the idea is that we want people to not only exercise moderation and control about the foods they're choosing, but also to see how it fits into their diet overall. So I will tell you right now, I love ice cream. That is probably one of my favorite foods. But if I'm going to choose to have ice cream, I'm going to exclude other foods from my diet during that day to make room for the ice cream, to give it a place that's appropriate in my diet. If I start my day with you know, a sugary donut and then at lunch I have a couple of chocolate chip cookies, really that ice cream shouldn't be there later. So I want to make sure that there's room and that it's appropriate. Okay, so moderation is something we want to really exercise um, most of the time. And, you know, the other idea that I kind of want to bring up a little tentatively is that moderation and moderation. Okay, there are some days when I'm going to go out for a really long bike ride and I'm going to come home and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to have two or three pieces of cake. And it's probably more than I would normally have, but it's okay in that situation. There's a reason for it. Um, and it might be somewhat appropriate. So, you know, my example may not be your example. Maybe um, it's your birthday and you've gone out and you're celebrating with your friends and you're going to have fish fry and you're going to have a couple of beers or some sodas and a whole bunch of things that you don't normally eat. It's okay to splurge, but a splurge is just that. It's a special opportunity at that one time. Okay, we've gotten into this habit of splurging throughout life and we want to kind of avoid that because we want to live a long and healthy life. So those are our five characteristics of a healthy diet. You're going to hear me refer to them throughout the semester, and I want you to keep them in mind when you look at your own diet. And then I want to take a few minutes to talk about why we choose the foods we choose. And this is where, if you were sitting in front of me, I would ask you why you're choosing the foods you choose. I mean, I know why I make certain choices. Um, it has to do with habit, maybe economics, uh, convenience, ease of preparation what my teenage daughters like to eat, um, the taste of food, the smell, um, the appearance, um, what I've heard about the food, if it's locally produced, if it's um, imported, all of these different reasons. One of the most important reasons we see for people choosing foods is actually advertisements. And if you think about um, Saturday morning cartoons, and maybe it's been a while since you've watched them, but tune in on Saturday and see what kinds of foods are being advertised to children. And you will find that it's very often sugar-sweetened cereals, um, highly processed cereals, um, things that aren't necessarily um, going to promote health. You do, you, I promise you, you're not going to see a broccoli commercial. You're not going to see a commercial for raspberries. Okay? So the advertising is an important reason, and that's not a good reason necessarily. Again, you could go to the supermarket. If you go down the cereal aisle, you're going to see that all of the foods we shouldn't E eating or choosing have cartoon characters, they're bright colors, they're at eye level, and certainly they're at the level of a child riding in a cart. So don't become a victim to that. Don't think that food is going to make you necessarily smarter or prettier or sexier or any of those things. It's about health. So we have to keep that as our goal and how it fits into our diet. Okay? And again, there's opportunities to splurge. Um, and also, you know, if you think about our visceral response to food, um, I was at the movie theater the other day. I had already eaten dinner. I wasn't at all hungry, but I smelled popcorn. And I was like, ooh, boy, I really want popcorn. And then I remembered, you know, hearing that the amount of fat on the movie theater popcorn, if I get it with butter, is the equivalent to three Big Macs. And I said, hmm, you know what? I'm not really hungry. I'm just seeing this food or smelling it and wanting it. So again, we have to take a step back and look at the choices we're making and not be on autopilot. Okay, so take a few minutes and think about this a little bit. I also want to talk about food types. 
Okay, there's a whole list uh, in the textbook and in the notes, and certainly spend a few minutes familiarizing yourself with those concepts. But I want to bring a couple of them to your attention in particular. Enriched and fortified foods. These are technically different, but for our purposes, I want to kind of group them together. What we're looking at with an enriched or fortified food is one that has vitamins and minerals or could have fiber added to it. So think about your shopping experience and the kind of foods you have in your cupboard. You may find all kinds of enriched foods that you hadn't really even noticed. For instance, a very common one is milk. Right? It has vitamin D added to it. Vitamin D doesn't naturally occur in that milk. Okay? We could also think about orange juice. There's, there's all kinds of different orange juices out there, and a lot of them now have calcium and vitamin D added to them. Breakfast cereals are a good example, breads, uh, pastas, those are all enriched and fortified foods. Okay? And they're really helpful for some people to meet those goals of adequacy, uh, especially around vitamins and minerals. You'll see that some breakfast cereals have fiber added. Uh, fiber one, for instance, that's got 51% of your fiber for the day. Um, that's an awful lot. It doesn't naturally occur in those little flakes and nuggets of grain. So they've added fiber there. They're also adding fiber to things like yogurt, a fiber called inulin. So look at the food labels, turn it over, get familiar with that, okay? It's not necessarily a bad thing. We just wanna be aware of it, okay? And when we're choosing foods, they can be an important part of achieving that adequacy measure. Then staple foods, and this is really um, culturally derived to a large extent. So the foods that we use in our society as staple foods, uh, people will cite things like uh, potatoes or bread. I should say that I can't think of a single culture or food tradition or culinary tradition that does not use some form of bread. It doesn't have to be made out of wheat, it could be corn, it could be based on millet, or um, quinoa or any kind of grain, but most groups have a bread product. Then we can look at, um, for instance, Chinese cuisine. Most people immediately say rice, and that's true, but rice is only part of the story. We also have noodles, that's a staple. Also things like vegetables can be a staple. Okay? So think about that a little bit. That's a food that's predominantly used in a culinary tradition. And whole foods. And I've got a picture of an apple here on this slide. And when we think about whole foods, we very often think about a food that's unmessed around with, one that it's in its natural packaging, and it's as nature intended. I try to be a little bit more practical. So for instance, I wouldn't eat the apple like this, right? I would cut it up probably. Um, it still makes it a whole food. If I were to make applesauce out of it, and it was just the water and the apple, I would still consider that pretty much a whole food. It's just been cooked. Okay, we really know the difference when we go down to the supermarket and we compare the apple to um, a box of Hamburger Helper or something like that. We know that Hamburger Helper, it might have elements of whole foods in it, but overall we can't say that it's a whole food because it's highly processed, highly engineered. Okay, so our goal for Americans is to eat many, many more of these whole foods and really rely on processed foods um, much less in our diet if we can. I also want to take a minute um, and just talk about nutrition information. If you think uh, broadly about where you're hearing nutrition talk, you're hearing it in the media, so that could be on the nightly news, it could be on the radio, magazines, all kinds of stories in magazines and newspapers. Um, maybe your Aunt Sally tells you about, you know, here's the greatest diet, I just tried it and I lost three pounds. So you're getting nutrition information from all of these sources, but they can't all be considered equal. Some of them have more validity, which means we can rely on them in different ways. Um, your Aunt Sally might be a lovely woman, but it doesn't necessarily mean that she has you know, the straight story on nutrition. We really, and I put a list here on the slide, of some of the nutrition experts that we can rely on. So a registered dietitian, that's someone that has gone through advanced training um, and has expert skills around nutrition and food choices and health. Um, certainly, you know, regular nutritionists and dietitians, people that aren't considered an RD, are a good source. Uh, medical profession, professionals, you could also talk to other people. So if you have, <coughs> excuse me, other healthcare workers in your life, maybe a naturopathic physician, a chiropractor, that I would treat a little bit more carefully, unless they have advanced training or some specialized knowledge, okay? Um, and when we look at sources of nu nutrition information, uh, especially like printed things, peer-reviewed journals. So this is the kind of thing that 
academics will read, um, doctors, nutritionists. Um, advertising, not a good source because they're not selling you nutrition, they're selling you a product. Okay, so if you go into the supermarket, you can see all kinds of health messages. Don't necessarily believe those. Food packaging, same thing, absolutely. Um, take it with a grain of salt, okay, because again, they're selling you things. The government and governmental organizations, and this is a bit tricky, right, because we want to believe the FDA, we want to believe the USDA, because that's our government. If we, you know, if we don't have good faith in them, where do we turn? But the real truth here is that they're 100% trying to do the right thing, but they are heavily influenced by lobbying organizations. And one of the ones that is highly criticized is the Dairy Council. So if you look at the new plate diagram, which has replaced the food pyramid, you'll notice that there are very specific recommendations around dairy product usage. Well, not everybody wants to have dairy products. Not everybody can tolerate dairy products. Okay? So those recommendations have been really strongly influenced by lobbying. So you know, consider that as well. Um, infomercials? No, absolutely not. You know, if you're watching TV at you know, 2.30 in the morning, first of all, go to bed because you need to have a lot of sleep. Um, but also, you know, again, they're selling you a product and testimonials. So this is where Aunt Sally might come in or um, even a, a sports professional or someone in the media might say, you know, I've been on the grapefruit diet and let me tell you, I feel wonderful. Well, that's that person's you know, experience. Very often it's a paid testimonial as well. So they're being, you know, compensated really to inform you about this product. So again, question that as well. So that's really an introduction um, to nutrition and um, all of those different vocabulary words are going to set the foundation for the entire course. So spend some time putting those on index cards or making sure that you have the concepts down really well in your head. Okay, see you next time.